everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is going to be all about my sewing machines. I've gotten quite a few requests over the years to make a video like this and with the holidays coming up this seemed like a good time. I also recently acquired two new sewing machines so now I have a little bit more to talk about. In this video I will be introducing you to my various machines as well as talking a little bit about each one, why I chose to buy it, how much they cost, whether or not I would recommend it, and the various pros and cons that each one has. But before getting started, I want to be very clear that I'm not a sewing machine expert. I'm not even a sewing machine expert on the machines that I own. There are definitely people out there who are a lot more passionate and knowledgeable about them than me. They're just a tool that I use for several hours every day to create clothing. So I feel like I have enough knowledge to talk about them, but I also don't want you to take everything that I say as complete and total fact. Definitely do your research and read additional reviews if you're looking into buying any of these machines, or just a sewing machine in general. Also, this is not a tutorial for how to use these machines. I don't want anyone to start off this video thinking it is instructional in nature. It's more of a review video. And on that note, let's get started. So I own three machines. The first one is an industrial machine and it is a Singer 191D20. The second one is a home sewing machine or a tabletop machine and it is the Singer Heavy Duty 4423. And I also own a vintage machine which is a Singer 1530. I don't have any affiliation with Singer uh, nor do I necessarily favor them over another brand. Those just happen to be the machines that I have. So the first sewing machine I have is a Singer 191D20. So here's a quick overview of the 191D20, which is the industrial machine. And this is by Singer, as you can tell by their branding, all over the place. Um, they make sure that you're very aware of that. <laughs> Up here you have the holder for the thread. The left one is used for threading the actual machine, and the right one is used for winding the bobbin. So down here you have the bobbin winder and the tension control for the bobbin winder. Here's the on-off button for the machine, but I'm not going to turn it on because then it will be very loud. This is the stitch length dial, and this causes the machine to reverse when you pull down on it. Over here you have one of the tension controls for the top thread, and here's the second one. The needle of this machine threads left to right and I don't actually thread it through this and this since I find that makes it more prone to unthreading itself even when I have the potentially correctly controlled up here. Back here you have the lever which lowers the feed dogs and most industrial machines actually have a lever underneath the machine that does this as well. We'll see if you can tell that that's me controlling it with my knee as opposed to my hand. This plate slides out of the way to reveal the bobbin. The bobbin goes into a casing like this and the tension for the lower thread is controlled by this screw. This weighs like 75 pounds, so it's a little bit difficult, but I can tip it back. This is what the underside looks like. This is the oil well. The bottom of the oil well has gotten dirty in the last couple of weeks, and I'm not sure why, so I think I'm going to drain it because it does lift out, and then thoroughly clean it, then refill it up with fresh oil. This part of the machine dips down into the oil and has an auto lubrication system, and then this wicks oil up to other parts that need it. And while this is open, I'll just put the bobbin back in. It makes a satisfying click. And there we go. This is an industrial machine and it cost me about $650 on eBay. And that was including shipping. Though that's definitely a lot of money and quite the investment, it is pretty comparable to mid-range Bernina or Brother sewing machine models. So I don't feel like that's ridiculous at all considering how sturdy this machine is and how well it has served me over the years. This machine is made for light to medium weight fabrics, which is kind of unusual for an industrial machine. I think people hear industrial and they think it can handle absolutely anything, but this machine is definitely geared towards the lighter and the mid end of fabrics. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend it if you're planning on making a lot of pairs of jeans and corsets and repairing saddles and making leather handbags or anything like that, but this one has served me really well for my purposes. It's actually the sister machine to the 191D30, which is geared more towards heavy fabrics. So the question I get most often is why I chose to buy an industrial machine, because they are industrial. You don't usually see them in people's homes. And the reason I bought one is because I kept breaking home sewing machines or tabletop machines. I ended up breaking two of them in a year, and the cost of repairs would have been almost the same as buying a new machine. And I really hated how disposable they seemed. So when I looked into alternatives, I learned about industrial machines, and I decided that that was perfect for me. Industrial machines differ from home sewing machines in quite a few ways. The main difference you may notice is that they are built into tables, and those tables usually have steel adjustable legs, which have the pedal mounted on it, the light, as well as the motor. And the motor is probably the biggest difference between it and a more commercial home sewing machine. The motor my industrial machine has is a 400 watt clutch motor. Because of 
that motor, the sewing machine can go a lot faster. It can sew up to 5,500 stitches in a minute, whereas most home sewing machines will only do around 800 to 1,200. Another big difference and the main one that attracted me to industrial machines is that they're made to be used in an industrial environment. So they're a lot more durable than a home sewing machine because they're created with the intention of being used for 8 or 12 continuous hours, whereas a home sewing machine is only intended to be used for a few hours every week. A home sewing machine might weigh 15 pounds, and this one weighs closer to 80. I often tell people that an industrial machine feels like a mix between a tank and a sports car because it's so durable and so fast, and a home sewing machine is like a Kia. No offense to Kias, but... So some of the other pros to industrial machine is that they're set into a table, so that means that your project can lay completely flat as you work on it, which is really nice, especially when you make big dresses like I do. I think they're also easier to maintain than home sewing machines, partially because they're less likely to break, but also because they have fewer safety mechanisms, which doesn't really sound like a positive, but that means that more pieces are out in the open. So when you do run into a problem where the machine is unthreading itself or it's jammed or anything like that, which is really quite rare with this machine, it's easy to identify where the problem is coming from and get it fixed nice and quickly. Even though it is an industrial machine, it's not complicated to use. The stitch length and tension and everything like that are controlled by wheels on the front of the machine, so it's really pretty simple. However, one thing to keep in mind with industrial machines is that they usually only do one stitch and that is a straight stitch. You can get industrial machines that do a zigzag stitch, but anything beyond that is pretty rare. So this sewing machine will only do a straight stitch. Um, I know this is a downside for a lot of people, but for four or five years that has been all I've needed. That's not to say there isn't a place for zigzag stitches and hemming stitches and stretch stitches, especially if you use a variety of different fabrics, but you can definitely do a lot with a straight stitch, and personally that has met most of my needs for the past couple of years. Another thing to keep in mind with industrial machines is that the speed is controlled by the pedal, so there's not a dial on it that goes from a little turtle to a bunny. If you press all the way down on that pedal, it will zoom the fabric through it. It goes very, very quickly. So there is a bit of a learning curve when it comes to that and controlling the speed. But once you get the hang of it, it's really convenient, especially when you're hemming, because you can just go through a whole bunch of fabric at once. It's a lifesaver when you're making petticoats. You're not really going to find industrial machines in stores. I know I'd never seen one before I purchased one, and unfortunately, I think that's the case for most people. They're very much something that you have to purchase online and get shipped to you. Also, definitely pay attention to whether they come assembled or not. Mine came in two big boxes with very poor instructions. It was kind of difficult to get together. I think it just depends on who ships it, whether or not they do that assembly in-house or if you have to do it in your house. Even though I love my industrial machine to bits and pieces, there are definitely a couple cons to it. The first being that it is difficult to service. Though I personally never had to get it serviced since the maintenance is quite easy to do. If there were a problem with it, there's no way I could take it to a repair shop. I'd have to have someone come here and fix it, which is kind of a pain. It's also much louder than a tabletop machine and once you turn it on that turns on the motor so even when you're not sewing there is this constant noise emanating from it. <laughs> So if you live in an apartment, that might be a problem. It also takes up quite a bit of space since it is part of a table and it cannot be detached from the table since the table supports its oil well and the light and the motor and all of those important things. Two things that I don't like about this particular machine is that a lot of the sewing machine feet are quite expensive, especially things like ruffler feet. They just get ridiculously costly compared to how much one would cost for a home sewing machine. I also find with this specific model that it's difficult to put the needles in, or rather it's difficult to tell with the needles in all the way. I'm constantly not pushing them in high enough and then it ends up nicking my bobbin casing and making a really ungodly noise, or it just unthreads itself whenever I try to sew. So I end up having to do quite a few tests every time I change the needle, which is a little bit frustrating. Also, as I've said, this model doesn't work especially well with heavyweight fabric, but it does work amazingly well with tulle and silk and organza and chiffon and materials that other industrial machines might struggle with. But because of that you might want to look into a different brand. I know I hear great things about Juki's. Now I got two main questions about this machine on Instagram and the first was is it good for beginners and the second was how do you maintain it and is maintenance difficult? As far as maintenance go I've never had to do anything too dramatic. I have had the belt slip off once which my dad fixed for me and I have also had to oil the base a few times. Other than that you just have to keep it free of lint like you would with any sewing machine and you also have to make sure that the oil well is up to the level it recommends and free of lint and pins and anything that might collect there over time. If you're not sure what an oil well is, it's basically 
basically this little trough of oil that sits underneath the machine. Part of the machine's mechanics actually dip down to the oil well, and there's also rope that is tied to various parts of the machine that dips down and serves as a wick to bring the oil up to the parts that need to be lubricated. If you are looking into buying an industrial machine, I highly encourage you to make sure it is self-lubricating or auto-lubricating or has a wick lubrication system. I think all of those things are the same thing. Basically, you don't want to have to oil your machine every hour. That's how a lot of the older industrial sewing machines operate, and I've heard that it can be quite frustrating, especially when you sew a lot. And in the few years I've had this machine, I've only had to refill the oil well a couple times. I'm still on the first bag of oil that it originally came with. As for how this machine is for beginners, I don't think it's a bad machine for beginners. I think it's probably easier to learn on it than it is to go from using a home sewing machine to using an industrial machine. Just because the threading process is slightly different and it is much faster. So if you start out being very hesitant because you're not used to a sewing machine at all, I think you'll probably adjust to the speed of the industrial faster than you might if you're used to the speed being limited by the machine's motor. You'll also probably get used to the way that it is threaded faster since it won't seem different to you. That's just the way you learn how to thread a machine. So hopefully that answers your question. I think it's an okay machine for beginners. It can be kind of scary though just because it is so loud and so fast and learning on a tabletop machine is probably a little bit less intimidating. My next machine is a Singer 1530. This is an antique machine that was probably originally made in 1910. This is the Singer 3015 and I haven't used her in a while so I'm just gonna wipe her down. I'm also going to be oiling the various points starting at the bottom. This is definitely the most complicated machine to thread and make bobbins on. Bobbin latches in place over here, up through this little thing and down through this. Then you press it down and you're gonna go around a couple times like so and then very slowly press on the pedal. Then the bobbin goes into its case. The spool sits here and then it threads down the side. The needle threads from left to right as opposed to front to back. This is the bobbin threader. This is the stitch length control. And speaking of that, I just wanted to show you how tiny stitches you can do with this. Can you see those? They're right there. So this is on the larger end of stitches it can do, and this is the smallest. My machine is missing the badge, that would usually go here. Um, these are the various different points where you oil it, and then this cover can be removed to reveal the bobbin. So you can replace that and check on that without having to tilt the machine back. This is the tension control for the top thread, and then the bottom thread tension is actually controlled by a screw on the bobbin casing. Back here there's also a light and a little motor. Wow, what a difference. I picked this machine up for $45, so it was quite a bit cheaper than the other one. I purchased this for two reasons as well. The first was that I wanted a machine that could handle really heavyweight fabrics because, as I said, my industrial isn't the best at that. I also really liked the idea of being able to use a historically accurate machine to make a historical costume, and I thought that would be a neat costume concept for a video and just a neat thing to do in general. So when I saw this on eBay with a local pickup that was like 40 minutes away for 45 bucks, I couldn't resist. And I'm so glad I bought it. I really, really love it. As you might notice, this machine is in a case and it also has a motor and a light attached to it. I believe it was converted to electric at some point between the mid-1920s and the mid-1950s. A lot of people don't like converted antique machines since it ruins their authenticity, uh, but I find that that makes it more convenient. This machine has definitely met and exceeded my expectations it, because this sews through thick fabric so much better than my industrial and so much better than the home sewing machine I'm going to show you in a minute. I would really suggest anyone that wants to make very thick corsets or work a lot with denim or leather or anything like that to look into getting an antique machine. You can usually find them on Craigslist or eBay for really reasonable prices, especially if you're willing to go and pick it up, and they are absolute beasts. This machine weighs like 45 pounds, which is three times the weight of my modern tabletop sewing machine. There's absolutely a reason that these machines have survived 100 years and are still in fantastic working condition, and I think they're probably going to survive another 100. They're so well made, and I think they're very comparable to the $800 modern machines on the market that are intended to sew heavier fabrics. So definitely look into one of these and see if you can get a deal on one in your area. They do have a couple drawbacks which I'm going to get into, but for the price this was such a fantastic addition to my collection and it really covers an area that neither of my other two machines does. So what are the issues with an antique machine? For one thing, this machine is quite slow, and I think that has more to do with the tiny motor than does the machine's actual capabilities. It probably could have gone faster with a crank or treadle, but I obviously don't have those, and I'm quite limited by the motor that it currently has. 
And I think other machines that have been converted in the same way will probably have that issue as well. And probably the biggest drawback for me is that it doesn't reverse. So there are older models that do reverse, but this one is from 1910 and it does not, which means you have to twist the fabric back and forth to build up some stitching or tie the stitching off after you're done. And both of those are quite inconvenient, so that's why I haven't really bothered to use this for anything unless it is made out of a fabric that my industrial doesn't handle particularly well. Another negative is that it requires oiling. So though this machine does tip back, it doesn't have an oil well or a wicking system. It has holes in the top as well as portions underneath that you have to oil manually anytime you want to use the machine. And it's definitely something to consider before buying one. This machine actually threads really similarly to my industrial. I know there are vintage machines out there that are a little bit more mysterious when it comes to threading them. They involve a shuttle and the method for threading them is quite different than modern machines. But the 1530, I believe, all have bobbin casings and side-loading bobbins, which are quite similar to modern industrials. Also, I think it goes without saying, but this machine only does a straight stitch. They do make zigzag attachments for it, but instead of moving the needle, they move the fabric back and forth. So that can lead to a lot of puckering and stuff, which you won't necessarily want. The maintenance for it hasn't been that difficult so far. I've just been keeping it free of lint and dust. Um, I did go through and try and get a lot of the oil residue off of it that was like around the needle and various mechanisms, but I don't think it did that good of a job, so I'm probably going to get it professionally serviced before I use this consistently for a project, which I'm planning on doing soon. It's also worth noting that a lot of places will service antique machines but won't service modern ones, and that's because these, like industrial machines, are made almost entirely out of metal, so they're a lot easier to repair and replace parts for than a plastic machine. With a plastic machine, when one thing breaks, it's more likely to break other elements, and then you have all of these pieces that need to be replaced, and it's just kind of a mess. So they're quite an easy machine to get serviced, and I would definitely recommend one if you need something to go through really heavyweight fabrics, or you just want one as a display piece, because they're really pretty. So the final sewing machine I'm going to talk about is the newest addition to my collection. I've had this for about a week, but I did have one a couple years ago, and I had that one for almost six months, so I feel somewhat qualified to talk about this, even though it is relatively new to me. And this is the Singer 4423. Here is the Singer Heavy Duty in the flesh. This portion will come off to create a smaller sewing surface, which is really nice when attaching sleeves. As far as general mechanics go, this is the tension wheel, this is the needle position control, this is the width of the stitch control, and then this is the bobbin winder. This is where the thread sits, and this is all of the threading mechanisms. This is what reverses the stitch, and then at the side you have a tension control for the bobbin. The foot of the machine releases with a little lever back here. There's also a little lever back here which you use when doing the buttonholes. I didn't find that when I was first trying to figure out how to do buttonholes, and it was really, really annoying. This is how you remove the needle. This control the length of the stitch and this controls the stitch that you're using. And here you can see all the various different stitches that it will do. This is a tabletop machine and it's branded as being a heavy duty machine so it has a steel body and is quite a bit more durable than comparably priced machines. This one cost me $135 and I purchased it through Amazon. This is the mid model of the heavy duty machines. There is the 411 which is closer to $100. It has fewer stitches and it doesn't have an automatic buttonhole but I believe the frame and motor and structure of it is the same. There's also the 4452 I think is its name and that has more stitches stitches and more buttonholes, but again, I believe it is the same frame. And that one is closer to $175. This machine is very popular. You can probably find it on display in Joann's. It's one of the few machines that they stock in stores and sell quite regularly. So if you want to go look at one before investing in it, you can definitely do that. I purchased this machine because even though I love my industrial and I love my antique machine, those are both straight stitch machines and I want something that would do a zigzag stitch and could sew buttonholes. For four years, I haven't needed either of those features, but I have a new 10 piece project coming up uh, that requires those so it was time to take the plunge and spend the $150 and I think it was worth it because I still really like this machine it's it's definitely what I remembered it's a sturdy little thing and it doesn't feel nearly as cheap and plasticky as some of the comparably priced ones and even some of the more expensive ones it definitely doesn't feel as durable as my industrial but I really like it and I actually quite enjoy sewing on it so this is a pretty speedy machine it can do 1100 stitches per minute and again this is a machine that is controlled by pressure on the pedal as opposed to a dial, so you can make it go as fast as you want. 
Though, I did burn out the motors on one of these by going fast, so maybe don't go too quickly. This particular machine has a one-step buttonhole and 23 stitches. I think it has all of these stitches that you will ever need unless you're looking to do decorative quilt designs. It has a straight stitch, a few different variations of stretch stitches and zigzag stitches slash satin stitches. It does an automatic buttonhole. It has a hemming stitch. And I think it's pretty much everything a seamstress needs as a basic tabletop sewing machine. The cons that I would say about this is that it isn't indestructible the way my other sewing machines are. It's more prone to tension problems than any of my other machines. I think this is just because a lot of the components are plastic so they move around and things need to be adjusted more frequently and are more prone to having problems. I also remember the bobbin casing for this would get out of place and I'd have to unscrew it and fiddle around and screw it back in and it was kind of a pain. I haven't had any problems with this machine yet but I have only had it for a week uh, so I feel like my experience with it a few years ago is probably a more accurate representation of this sewing machine overall. Another thing I would say about this machine is it doesn't stitch things very densely. So even though it does have a one-step buttonhole, I tend to have to go over that several times to get the stitching dense enough that the material won't fray when I cut into it. So if you're looking into doing a lot of satin stitches or decorative stitches, this won't be the best choice for you. Also, as I said earlier, I have had one of these before and I broke it. I don't know quite what happened, but I was in the middle of making a petticoat and something must have gotten out of alignment because it's started making a squeaking noise when I sewed and then it started making a burning smell a couple days later and then it stopped working completely so I don't know if I burnt out the motor or what I took it in to get a quote for what it would be to repair and I believe it was like a hundred dollars and this was a $120 machine so that was what ultimately led me to getting the industrial but I do think this is a good machine if you're not going to use it to death. Um, so I think if you're doing a more normal amount of sewing in a week, this will serve you really well. It does okay with thick fabrics, but I would not try and stress it with a lot of leather or anything. I would personally leave that to an antique machine or a machine that is specifically designed for it. Though you can probably get away with doing it on this machine, it's probably going to really shorten its lifespan. So either be prepared to replace it at some point if you're going to be using a lot of heavy fabrics, or be prepared to invest in a more expensive machine for those things. Even though I think you can get a really decent sewing machine for $150, I don't think you can get a sewing machine for $150 that does everything. In fact, I don't think there's a single machine out there that does everything perfectly. You can buy a $3,000 sewing machine and it's going to do embroidery really well, but it's not going to have a very solid straight stitch. You can buy a really nice straight stitch machine, but it obviously won't do buttonholes and zigzags and the other things that you might need on a regular basis. So that's why a lot of people have more than one sewing machine, even though that isn't ideal, that's what ends up happening for a lot of people and that's what's happened for me. So those are my thoughts on it. It's a good little machine. I would highly recommend it, uh, but don't expect it to do everything and last forever, especially if you're using it a lot. I do also have some experience with Janome machines and I'm not a big fan of those. My first sewing machine ever was a Janome that was around $350 and it was one with all the stitches and the screen and it was supposed to be really great. I had so much trouble with it. Even when I could get it working properly, as soon as I wanted it to do any of the fancy stitches, it would jam and it was just an absolute disaster. I ended up moving on from that quite quickly and that's when I got the Singer Heavy Duty, which I much, much preferred even though it was a much cheaper machine that did a lot less. Even the higher end Janome's that I've used but not personally owned, I haven't enjoyed working on. I just feel like a lot of the tabletop machines feel quite plasticky and I don't enjoy using them. I've also sewn on a few CG590 Singer machines which are also branded as being heavy duty steel frame machines. The two sewing classes I've taken have used these and I haven't liked them and the teachers haven't liked them uh, so I wouldn't recommend that either. So I think that is everything I have to say about my trio. I really enjoy all of these machines for different reasons. I don't think any of them are perfect uh, but they definitely serve the purposes that I bought them for really well and I've got pretty much all of my bases covered between these three. Before signing off I'm going to answer some questions I got asked on Instagram. I have a feeling I will have answered most of them throughout this video but there might be some neat ones in there. So I'm going to ask which one is my favorite. My favorite is definitely the industrial. It has served me so well over the past four years and if I had to pick only one to keep it would be that one. Someone else asked how do I look after them and if I have any cleaning or maintenance routines. Uh, nothing in particular, I just try and keep them free of lint. Definitely take off the feed dog plate and clean underneath there because lint can really collect up there. If you have a tabletop sewing machine, then I'd suggest taking out the case that holds the bobbin and cleaning that and cleaning underneath that because it's amazing what will get down there. 
And for the industrial and the antique machine, I just flip them up and make sure to clean the bottom. You do also have to keep on top of the oil for both the industrial and the antique machine. But that's about it. Someone asked what the benefits of a vintage machine is. And in addition to looking pretty, as I said earlier, it's a lot more durable than any of the other machines that I own. Pretty much anything you can fit underneath its foot, it will sew through. Like, I think you could get plywood underneath it and it would stitch through it. So I wouldn't really recommend trying that at all. Someone else asked if the threads tangle up and if the machines jam often. It's quite rare for my machines to jam. With the industrial, when it happens, it's usually user error. Uh, either I haven't wound the bobbin tightly enough or the bottom tension is wrong. It's actually a lot more common for me to have issues with the top tension, which causes the machine to unthread itself or to have the needle down too far, which also causes it to unthread itself, especially when I try and reverse. That's probably my bigger issue on a regular basis. It doesn't jam very often at all. I haven't really used the antique machine enough to have it jam. Mostly I've done it on test swatches and stuff like that. And for the 4423, I do recall its predecessor having a lot of issues with jamming. Um, or maybe not a lot, it definitely had less than the other tabletop machines I worked on, but compared to the industrial, it did jam quite often. Granted, I was also significantly less experienced at sewing during that time, so we'll see if I have those issues now. Someone asked if there is anything the standard home machine is better at than the industrial. One of the nice things about the home sewing machine is, of course, the variety of stitches. My industrial can't do buttonholes. I've done a lot by hand over the years, and that's kind of annoying. Also, the home sewing machines have a removable casing at the front that makes it much easier to attach sleeves or lining into wrist cuffs or tiny areas. With the industrial machine, since you're working on a smooth plane, that can be kind of challenging sometimes. So I'm really excited to have that feature back uh, by having a home sewing machine. Someone asked if I ever used a treadle machine, and no, I have not. I've seen them. I think they're beautiful. I'd love to own one. I would love to use one, but I do not have room for them right now. Someone else asked if I use sergers. I actually own a serger, but I cannot tell you what brand it is because I have never used it. I don't know. It's sitting in my closet collecting dust. Uh, when I first started out, I was quite lazy at sewing, and I was worried a serger would prevent me from lining garments and finishing seams with French seams and just do a really pretty level of finishing. Because I knew if I had a serger, I just wouldn't bother with any of that, and I really wanted to learn how to do all of those things properly and to implement them in my work on a regular basis. So that's why I never started using a serger, and I like doing things the way I do it now, but if I ever want to sew on a more professional level, then I definitely need to learn how to, so I should pull it out someday and try and give that a shot. So when I have to if I have a dream machine. I'd like to have a treadle sewing machine at some point when I have the room for it. I also really like the very old singers that are from like the 1880s. I think that's such a cool piece of sewing history and I would love to have one. As far as a dream sewing machine to use on a regular basis, I don't really have one. I'd much rather put money into getting a better dress form or a dress form in a different size or something like that. Someone asked how I fix tension problems, especially when the bottom thread gets all looped up. Usually I find it's an issue with the bobbin or the needle as opposed to the actual tension. As far as tension issues go, some lower quality machines are just predisposed to those issues and there's not much you can do. Other than that, I think it just comes down to practice playing around with it and figuring out which stitch length goes best with which tension level and what fabrics and all of that. Also, if you're having a lot of problems, change the needle, make a new bobbin, try making the bobbin out of a different type of thread, re-thread the machine, and turn it on and off again, and then see if that works better. And always do your test swatches when you're having machine problems on two or three layers of cotton or muslin, so it's a really inoffensive fabric that you're testing things on. And if it works on that, then you can play around, try and get it to work on your other materials. All right, so this is a bunch of questions about the industrial. How easy is it to learn to use, troubleshoot, change the tension and feet, etc. And what does it do better than a standard home machine? I think I've already weighed the pros and cons between industrial and a home sewing machine. As far as how easy it is to use, I think once you learn how to do it, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's not that challenging or complicated, it's just different than a home sewing machine. And as far as troubleshooting, I think it's way easier to troubleshoot than a normal home sewing machine because it's usually an issue with the way it's threaded or the tension or the thread itself rather than the actual machine. So pretty much any problems are user error, which is frustrating, but means it's a lot easier to fix because you're not worried about the mechanics being the underlying problem. And I think that pretty much covers all of the questions. So I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if there's anything that I didn't answer, feel free to ask me down below. I'll try and put more information and links to these various machines in the description box, and a couple of resources for anyone who's looking to buy sewing machines and wants some recommendations. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed filming this, so I hope you guys enjoyed watching it, and I will talk to all of you very soon.